Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to the Psychology of Bilingualism and Multilingualism. I am Dr. Ark Varma from the Department of Cognitive Sciences at IIT Kanpur. In this week, I am talking to you about the relationship of bilingualism and multilingualism with the other cognitive functions. In the last couple of lectures, we talked about the relationship of bilingualism and multilingualism with different aspects of thought. In today's lecture, I want to talk about the relationship of bilingualism and multilingualism with intelligence. Now, so far we've basically reviewed studies from the perspective of linguistic relativity, wherein the focus was actually to investigate whether the peculiarities of languages known by a bilingual might actually influence their perceptual and thought processes about the world. However, there has also been a range of studies that have focused mainly on the effects of bilingualism on general cognitive abilities such as intelligence, memory, aspects of uh, executive control, emotion and so on. In the next set of lectures, I will actually focus on these aspects of the relationship between bilingualism and cognition. Now, studies actually looking to investigate the effects of bilingualism on general cognitive abilities do not necessarily need to have a very sophisticated understanding of the structure of languages involved. Rather, they seek to investigate the user of the languages and uh, you know for the presence and absence or of enhancement or uh, detriment say for example in these specific abilities as a consequence of their bilingualism. You could say that somebody in your neighborhood is uh, very smart because they know four or five or six different languages or you could say that maybe because that person speaks two or three languages that is where they are not very good in any of the languages they know. Also, uh, people have always been curious about whether knowing more, uh, more than one language makes you more intelligent, less intelligent, makes you, uh, you know, communicatively more effective, not uh, so effective and so many different things. In this lecture, we sort of starting to sort of look at this debate and see whether uh, bilingualism actually has any measurable impact on any of these general cognitive functions that we're talking about. Typically, when you're looking at studies that want to do this, they are actually trying to compare a group of bilinguals with a carefully matched group of monolinguals on factors such as age, socioeconomic status, education, etc., etc., parents, uh, uh, you know, education and so on, in terms of, and then basically compare their performance in terms of a well-chosen task that would reveal a latent variable. See, for example, if you want to check somebody's concentration, if you want to check some how somebody's problem-solving capabilities, if you want to check somebody's uh, you know abilities in terms of uh, managing uh, responses selecting co uh, correct responses and so on so typically what people have been doing or people would do is that they would basically uh, select a group of bilinguals and they would select a group of uh, matched monolinguals which are not different in age gender socioeconomic status and so many of these things and then actually the only difference between these two groups will be that one of these groups is a bilingual and the other is a monolingual and then both of these groups perform on a task and you basically compare okay uh, any differences in their performances in the in the, in the task actually can be uh, zeroed in on the bilingualism of these different part on on these participants so here if you sort of uh, you know want to uh, go ahead in this uh, direction task selection is actually of very special importance because the same must be chosen on the, on the basis of an informed hypothesis you will not randomly pick a task you, so there are many experimental tasks people who are students of cognitive science or cognitive psychology would know that there are plenty of experimental tasks that are going around and if you want to choose one of these tasks to compare the differences between bilinguals and monolinguals, you should have some kind of an informed intuition or an informed hypothesis about how bilinguals or monolinguals would perform on these tasks and whether and what kind of differences there are to expect uh, between these two, uh, between the performances of bilinguals and monolinguals on these tasks. Say for example, you could uh, take a test of vocabulary and you would actually expect that, okay, because monolinguals are exposed to only one language language but probably in, they are exposed to this one language in great detail they would have a much better vocabulary of this particular language whereas because bilinguals are exposed to two or three languages uh, and they are probably because of you know just the distribution of time and this is just the distribution of the amount of time they uh, use these languages they might not have as big a vocabulary in each of these languages as the monolingual speakers would have so you can have any kind of question and you based on that question you will select your task and then you will co compare the performance of bilinguals and monolinguals. 
more recently what has also been happening is that people have been basically just picking up bilinguals uh, a range of uh, bilinguals and basically comparing the performance of different types of bilinguals or you know on different uh, uh, types of bilinguals by virtue of their degree of proficiency in the second language age of acquisition of second language uh, early or simultaneous bilingual we've talked about all of these differences so far you can actually compare by within bilinguals also how they perform on a given task and if you have a, a informed hypothesis it would tell you basically uh, that okay what kind of difference to expect and later how would you try to explain these differences let's take an example as i was saying researchers could uh, you know hypothesize that due to a vaster conceptual world of bilinguals as uh, compared to monolinguals they would possess a relatively higher skill in divergent thinking because bilinguals are exposed to you know concepts concepts from two different languages maybe sometimes three or four different languages they would probably be able to think divergently more as compared to monolinguals or the hypothesis that you know uh, because of their practice with managing their two co-activated languages bilinguals may possess superior abilities of cognitive control as compared to monolinguals so you can have any of these hypotheses you can you choose a task which is testing for these uh, specific abilities and then you could compare the performance of bilinguals and monolinguals on these uh, you know uh, tasks now interestingly given the structure of the two languages of a bilingual uh, is not really a concern here the bilinguals knowing any pair of languages could be actually be recruited in these experiments although the effects of on uh, of these tasks on cognition may actually vary depending upon uh, you know the typological differences between the two known languages of a bilingual for instance the ability of divergent thinking in bilinguals may be more if the bilinguals have learned two distinct languages say for example a hindi english bilingual may be known to have or a, a, a bit more uh, ability in terms of divergent thinking as compared to uh, you know a dutch english bilingual or a spanish catalan bilingual for that matter the same may apply for any kind of ability that you are actually intending to test additionally to sort of uh, ensure that the participants are actually well matched the experimenters collected information about a number of background variables such as uh, you know the children's and their parents attitudes towards learning french or english in their academic performance in school their ages gender socio economic status degree of education and so many other things now the authors initially had hypothesized based on the contemporary literature that had been uh, you know uh, collecting so far that bilingualism would actually be detrimental to their performance on these tasks of intelligence however in contrast to their expectations the bilingual children actually outperformed significantly the monolingual children on the majority of tests and subtests both in verbal and nonverbal intelligence more precisely the bilingual children were found to be better in concept formation in and in tasks that required mental flexibility and also they showed a more diversified set of mental abilities than the monolingual controlled children interestingly these results were actually very robust and stable and did not change when the differences between the two groups were matched uh, specifically for socio economic uh, class age gender etc and again these results did come as a surprise for the investigators as they were con uh, as they were rather contrary to the contemporary literature and consequent intuitions however the authors later observed that some of the earlier studies which had not found these differences may have lacked some degree of experimental rigor and had not really controlled for various variables such as age gender socio economic status amount of education etc which may have uh, been the reason why they were not finding these differences so far However uh, it is also discussed that some of the early studies were not really standardized and sometimes the bilingual children were tested in their weaker language and hence leading to uh, you know lower scores on uh, lower scores on these tests say for example if you are uh, you know uh, testing uh, uh, early uh, you know uh, uh, testing a bilingual who's just picking up his second language say for example somebody who's just learning english and has only spoken or performed in hindi for let's say uh, till their high school or till their senior second secondary now if you start testing these people directly in english and they have little or less knowledge of english uh, obviously they will score less in in these tests because these tests are in english and you see that uh, you know in in our country also uh, a lot of exams are actually you know provide bilingual alternatives so that we can actually um, handle the confound of language as a barrier to their overall intelligence 
Now, while researchers actually reason about the reasons, uh, you know, for earlier studies not finding any beneficial effects on bilingualism, some actually wondered about the uh, unique points of this study by Peel and Lambert and why this study would have been able to find uh, the differences between bilinguals and monolinguals. One of the things that was noted that it could be that the Montreal region of Canada where the uh, participants in the study were actually selected from, both English and French were socially highly valued and they were respected languages. And therefore, the acquisition of English by French speaking children of this region was not really seen as a threat on their learning uh, French and, and basically it was no uh, social pressure was not there to pick up this language. So in, in a sense, these children were happily learning, uh, you know, English and they were not to be threatened by it or there was no social pressure to learn or to not learn English. So in fact, learning English did not really put them into danger of losing their French and rather added to their linguistic repertoire with a new language and a, with, uh, you know, with exposure to a new conceptual world at the same time. So this basically can be referred to as a form of bilingualism that adds to a bilingual's overall linguistic repertoire and the existing language does not suffer a cost at all. This was referred to as additive bilingualism by Peel and Lambert. Now, an opposite scenario is also possible. An opposite scenario could have been that uh, could have been referred to as subtractive bilingualism, wherein basically the bilingual would feel forced to put aside their own native language or subtract from their knowledge of the ethnic languages for a more prestigious and you know necessary national language. Say, for example, if they were forced to learn English and leave out French, it would sort of uh, harm them in and their general cognitive functioning. Here, the new learned L2 could, would, could be generally, you know, gradually expected to replace the L1, which would weaken the native language and therefore have detrimental effects for general cognitive functioning. As neither of the two languages would become, you would you know, now be seen as a natural tool for the expression of thought and, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, any kinds of their feelings. Now, this is very similar to, you know, what you can see is uh, is being talked about in the country now that we are trying to give chance to people to learn in their native languages. It is very important for individuals to learn in their native language so that they can grasp better, they can understand better. And there is no burden of learning English before they, uh, you know, can uh, uh, grasp more sophisticated concepts. Finally, the authors also reason that the children in Peel and Lambert's study actually performed better than monolinguals because they, you know, had this util they, they actually could utilize the opportunities available to them for becoming these additive bilinguals. Now, alternatively, another possible reason for uh, Peel and Lambert's findings could also be that the relationship between bilingualism and intelligence would be the other way around. Now, some researchers actually wondered that maybe it is not that bilingualism is helping these children become more intelligent. It is because they are already intelligent. They are being able to become bilingual and utilize the opportunities of learning the two languages. And because they are already intelligent, they would anyway score better on the tests of uh, you know intelligence that they were tested upon. Now. This is uh, an interesting proposal, but actually the best way to do this or to determine the causality of the relationship between bilingualism and intelligence, one would actually need to design a study, maybe a longitudinal study where two mash groups where in one group you would actually have the experimental treatment, let's say give the opportunity to these kids to become bilingual and in the other this opportunity would not be present. On all other respects, these two groups should be completely mashed. And actually, there was a bunch of longitudinal studies that actually suggest that bilingualism did improve general cognitive function, functioning to a certain extent. Let's look at a study like that. For instance, Scott in 1973 compared two groups of English Canadian children. At the start of the study, the children from one group, which was the experimental group, were actually given the opportunity to become bilingual through immersion schooling in French over a couple of years, whereas children from the other group, which was the control group, were actually not given this opportunity and were schooled exclusively in English. Now, the children from both these groups were actually matched on IQ and other socioeconomic status in the beginning of the study already. In another study, a random selection of schools in an area of uh, New Guinea, uh, which is a French speaking locale in America, were permitted to offer part of their uh, elementary uh, curriculum in French, which was the children's home language. 
and another group of uh, schools uh, with children uh, of similar intelligence and socioeconomic backgrounds was actually uh, you know not allowed to do this and they offered an all english curriculum so you can see one group of schools is allowing the uh, bilingual exposure to these kids whereas the other group of school is not allowing bi bilingual exposure to these kids and both groups are actually matched now when the when children in these two uh, studies were tested after a gap of few years children from both these studies actually outperformed the other monolingual group that uh, uh, you know on test that tested for the aspects of cognitive functioning such as math or a divergent thinking so you can see that in some sense bilingualism all things considered is actually helping these kids become better Finally in a third longitudinal study which was conducted by Kessler and Quinn in 1980 a group of hispanic american english children um, uh, hispanic american children were provided with the opportunity to learn subject matter in their home language and uh, uh, which was spanish and their performance on a number of tasks was actually compared to that of a socioeconomically uh, more privileged group of middle class monolingual english speaking white children Now interestingly both groups of children were given extensive training program in science inquiry through discussions films and hypothesis testing Now not surprisingly as we've been seeing in the study so far the students from the Hispanic American group actually outperformed those in the English American group in problem solving capabilities generating hypotheses of a higher complexity and even generating those uh, uh, you know hypotheses uh, in a better quality of linguistic structure than their english counterparts so if you look at uh, you know all of these th studies in totality you would realize that these results actually suggest that bilingualism does have some positive impact on cognitive functioning and that it is useful to allow ethnic minority children to nurture their home language and thus to convert their experiences from subtractive bilingualism into adapt ad additive bilingualism so interestingly while we've been talking about the benefits of bilingualism we've been talking about how it can help people's intelligence and so on there are also a range of studies that have uh, you know uh, be, uh, have pointed out certain drawbacks in being bilingual for instance researchers have actually shown that as compared to monolingual norms bilingual children actually have relatively smaller vo vocabularies in their separate languages it's probably because as bilinguals have two fully developed lexicons the uh, you know and two words for the same concept each single words gets used much less often uh, than a single word that a monolingual uses and therefore is susceptible to loss and forgetting and uh, you know overall being lower in the frequency now the this is also one of the reasons that uh, you know word retrieval is in fact slower and more effortful in bilinguals compared to monolinguals so this also sort of supports this notion that yes bilinguals typically will have lower vocabulary in each of their two languages as opposed to monolingual speakers of both their languages interestingly bilingualism has also been linked to advantages in metalinguistic awareness for example the ability to reflect on and manipulate the structural features of language uh, independent of meaning now oh, metalinguistic awareness is basically when you're not really just caught in the uh, meanings of individual words but whatever overall sense uh, you're getting and researchers have actually suggested that metalinguistic awareness is actually increased in bilinguals because of their dual linguistic environment you know they are they are having exposure to two very different sometimes very diagonally opposite conceptual worlds which actually enables them to appreciate or pay special attention to the structural aspects of both their languages in other words because they have two fully developed linguistic system it affords them a chance to analyze and compare the two and hence gain more insights about both of these linguistic systems now for instance one of the uh, you know examples of the said metalinguistic awareness has actually been the observation that bilinguals have greater word awareness than monolinguals and have the knowledge of the words form and meaning and have the knowledge that wo uh, words form and meaning are not actually entirely inseparable entities they know they sort of already get the sense that these two things are arbitrarily related how would this happen say for example i am a hindi english bilingual i know that there is a word sab for uh, this particular fruit and there is a word apple for this particular fruit i would know that both sab and apple do not have anything to do with the fruit itself they are just two different ways of calling out this particular concept 
and this realization would make me uh, sort of ponder about uh, you know how uh, you know these two words are related to the uh, object and what are the different meanings that can be implied and so on this works even better when you're talking about more abstract entities rather than concrete nouns now in order to uh, generate uh, or gain empirical support for these observations from leopold yanko voral actually hypothesized that the early separation of word sound and word meaning might actually cause a degree of accelerated semantic development in bilingual children as compared to monolingual children now the underlying assumption here was that attention to form aspects is a developmentally earlier stage than attention to meaning aspects and bilingual children would actually be able to do this much earlier than monolingual children because for them there is uh, you know these two things are much more tightly knitted now yanko voral tested for these hypotheses while in a semantic phonetic preference test in which afrikaans english and monolingual english and afrikaans children so again there are three groups were actually presented with a set of standard words each accompanied by two choice words one of the latter two words were similar uh, you know in sound to the standard say for example cap and can are very similar in sound and the other was semantically related to the standard word say for example cap and hat now cap and hat are semantically related whereas cap and can are phonetically related now the participants in this study were actually asked to select the choice word most similar to the standard so you can basically they were asked questions like i have three words cap can and hat which is more like cap can or hat now if the in, if the children are actually going for uh, semantic relatedness they would actually go by cap and hat and if they are actually going just by the cosmetic property of phonology they would probably uh, say cap and can are more similar to each other now all of these participants were children young children aged between 4 and 6 and 7 to 9 years and they were tested in both their languages and their performance in afrikaans and english was compared to the performance of that of uh, you know african english bilinguals respectively now in this uh, for this, as far as results are concerned the authors actually predicted that the older children would select the semantically related alternative much more often than the younger children and that within each group bilingual children would select the semantically related alternative much more often than the monolingual controls indeed the results actually showed that semantic preference did increase with age so basically we are seeing that with age children are uh, getting this uh, you know awareness of uh, semantics and uh, conceptual relatedness between objects but this age function actually was there only in monolinguals in bilinguals they did not see this age function because the bilinguals had actually achieved this stage much earlier in life so with change say for example between 4 to 6 years and 7 to 9 years there was no difference in age because both of these groups are already performing at a ceiling which tells us again in turn that bilinguals are indeed better in their metalinguistic awareness as compared to their monolingual counterparts moving on in another experiment uh the authors actually ga gathered evidence that the accelerated semantic development of the bilinguals was related to their early awareness of the relationship between word form and word reference is arbitrary now herein children were asked three types of questions we are still talking about the yanko varal study is in just another follow up experiment that they are doing in this study they are actually asking three types of questions say for example why is the dog called a dog and these questions called for a judgment of whether or not the word names could be interchanged say for example could you call a dog cow and a cow dog and questions that call for interchange of word names in play say for example let us play a game let us call a dog cow now does this cow has ho have horns does this cow give milk now if you see that if the children will have this awareness of the fact that uh, the animal and the name cow or the animal and the name dog attached to it are actually different things uh, and they are not really related the the cow word does not have anything to do with the cow and the dog word does not have anything to do with the dog animal then they would very easily be able to change these things say for example if they are if they are asked to exchange the names they would still be able to do that while appreciating at the same time that even if you call the cow dog it would still have horns it will still give milk and if you call the dog cow it would still bark 
now this is uh, something sort of uh, you know interesting and it basically explicitly tests the children on their uh, knowledge of whether these relationships are arbitrary or not and again just to sort of remind you the realization that this relationship is arbitrary would come much more naturally and earlier to bilinguals because they have two systems uh, two words to map on a single concept as compared to monolinguals who had one uh, uh, concept mapped onto one word and would think that this relationship is rather intricate now in this experiment again the bilingual children outperformed the monolingual controls on the second type of questions you know when when you were asking to interchange them and the performance of both groups on the questions of the remaining types was rather similar now now in the backdrop of what we have been discussing if you look at this uh, based on the differential result of bilinguals on the second type of questions the authors actually concluded and it made sense that bilingual children are actually aware of the arbitrary relationship between a word and its meaning at a much younger age than a monolingual child so it tells us that you know this metalinguistic awareness is also benefited or is something that the uh, bilingual children are sort of uh, you know endowed with or they grasp it at a very early age which may augur very well for other kinds of cognitive functions which these bilingual kids would actually engage in this is all that i wanted to talk to you about in today's lecture and i'll see you on the other side with a different lecture thank you